Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Writing Compelling Villains panel. Uh, we're so glad to have you with us tonight. We're so glad to have all of our wonderful panelists with us as well. Before we dive into that uh, subject, I'd like to have all of the panelists please introduce themselves, starting with Joshua. Okay, starting with me. <laughs> My name is uh, Joshua Palmatier. I am a fantasy writer with uh, Daw Books. Uh, my first series is now available as one gigantic omnibus uh, called The Throne of Amonkor. Uh, so go ahead and check that out. My most recent series though, uh, starts with uh, Shattering the Lay. The entire series is now out. Um, and it's all about uh, us using ley lines in this fantasy world uh, but much more modern feel than most uh, fantasies. Um, in addition, I uh, have founded a small press called Zombies Need Brains, and we produce uh, themed science fiction and fantasy anthologies. So uh, go ahead and check that out, uh, see what kind of themes we have available and are coming out soon. Okay, I'll put links up in the chat. Great, thank you. And Valerie? Hi, I'm Valerie Estelle Frankel. I am the author of lots of books about Doctor Who, Game of Thrones, Star Wars, Buffy, Xena, superheroes, and of course, all those have great villains. I write so much on the heroine's journey and the hero's journey, and now I'm writing a book on the villain's journey, well, wrote it, and that'll be out from publisher in a few months, and I've already got a YouTube and a big reading list up, so let's talk about arcs. Awesome. Mark? My name is Mark Van Name. I have five novels out. I've edited or co-edited four anthologies. I have about three dozen short stories, um, about 60 assorted essays, and about 1,500 computer articles. Okay, and Sherry. Hey, I'm Sherry cook Woosley, and I'm an author. My novel is called Walking Through Fire. And then in 2021, I've had three different stories come out in three different anthologies. So I'm very excited about that. Um, one of them is called Once Upon a Dystopia and it's Fractured Fairy Tales. And one is my horse story, I'm a horse girl. Um, so Thrilling Adventure Yarns 2021. And then a portal story in Black Eyed Peas on New Year's Day. Terrific. And I'm Gail Z. Martin and Morgan Bryce as Gail, I write Epic fantasy, urban fantasy, near future, post-apocalyptic fiction, and more. And as Morgan, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. And all across those stories, there are a lot of villains. So let's dive into this. And let's start with telling us who your favorite villain is. And that can be from any medium, starting with Sherry. Okay, so that's a super easy question. I love Missy from Doctor Who. I just love her. I love as soon as she comes on the screen and I just want her to have her way all the time, even though I know that would be terrible for the entire universe. Mark. That's a hard one, but I guess I would probably pick Moriarty from the, the stories. Okay, Valerie. I like ones where you can really see their side of things. So I really liked what She-Ra did with Catra recently. Okay, and Joshua. <laughs> this is gonna be so cheesy, but I'm gonna say Darth Vader, but not Darth Vader after the, the uh, episode four, five, and six. I like Darth Vader in four, five, and six. <laughs> and I'm going to go with Crowley from Supernatural because, uh, you know, for the King of Hell, he was a pretty cool guy. Now think about those villains that you picked as your favorite. What is it about them and their villainy that um, endears them to you, so to speak, or that sets them apart from all the other villainous characters out there? Uh, Mark? I like smart villains that have agendas that make sense to their value system. I think in general, villains that just want to do bad things aren't very believable to me because there's no impetus behind it that's sensible. I don't think in the real world there are many real villains. They're just people pursuing different agendas from a different set of cultural assumptions. And 
So I like villains that that makes sense. They really believe in their cause. They're doing what they're doing because they think it's the right thing. And I like them to be intelligent because in general, I prefer intelligent characters. Okay. Valerie? Yeah. Uh, Katra has a legitimate complaint. In episode one, she and she are both evil and moving up the ladder of evil hench people. And then she just ditch Adora whatever ditches her in episodes two and three and decides to be a good guy and Katra is just standing there for the entire series going what's up with this we were best friends we watched each other's backs and you completely ditched me to be a goody two-shoes so again every time you see her she's got a very legitimate complaint and rather like Draco just every minute of her time is being obsessed with the heroine and vice versa, you could really believe what they've got going psychologically. Okay, Joshua? Yeah, basically it's the same thing. I, I like my villains to be human. Um, so I like them to have their ups and their downs and their wins and their losses. And, and like Mark said, I want them to be smart. I want them to, I want their motivations to be clear and not be, you know, cheesy. Um, they, I, I, what it really boils down to is I just want them to be human, um, and, and be able to see their side of things. Um, so yeah. Okay. Sherry? So I really like the relationship between Missy and the doctor. And I, I really like that when I, when I see that, that trope of like, where the protagonist and the antagonist know each other better than anyone else and there's just this feeling that if a couple things had shifted a couple things had changed they wouldn't be in conflict and yet because of who they are they will always be in conflict and it it gets me every time it gets me that relationship and one of the things i loved about crowley was his character arc that he started out as villainous pretty much for the sake of villainy because that's what the king of hell does and he became more of a frenemy uh, depending on what his agenda was and so you were never quite sure whether he was going to have your back or stab you in it and uh, we got to watch him grow as a character and find out more of his motivations and find out why he did what he did and um, he ended up pretty much at odds with his own uh, ambition and ended up a hero despite himself. So that was that was an interesting character arc for where he started. So everyone has talked about smart villains and villains who see themselves as the hero of their own stories and conflicting agendas. So let's just get this question out of the way. And of course, there's the famous quote in Batman that some people, some men just like to watch things burn. What about the villain that is almost a psychotic force of nature that is uh, chaotic evil? Is there still a place for that kind of villain in storytelling, Valerie? Yeah, because, you know, if we're following the hero and the hero is trying to predict the opponent's bet. Uh, next move as you were saying with Joker you can't predict the next move or you're going to have to go into a very messed up place to figure out the next move and sometimes they're anti-heroes like Catwoman I might call chaotic neutral but heavy on the chaotic and her comics are still running strong okay Joshua yeah there, there's certainly a place for him um, part of it is that they bring in you know, unpredictability into uh, the stories and whatnot, like Valerie was saying. But uh, but I think everybody knows that that even in the real world, you've got those people where it's just they do things, and you're just like, I have, I don't understand this at all. So you know, their their motivation makes no sense whatsoever. Um, sure, it probably makes sense inside of their head. Uh, whenever, whatever it is that they're doing, and, but but that that type of character does exist in the world. Um, obviously, you know, like Batman, it's like augmented and 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 extrapolated to uh, a larger degree than the real world. But uh, but they exist; they're out there. Um, I think they're 
extremely difficult to write because it's hard to put your head into their headspace uh, unless you want to admit things you probably shouldn't be admitting. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh, but yes, I think they're really, really hard to write. And, uh, but they certainly have a place in, in certain stories. Um, I don't think they have a place in every story though. Okay, Sherry? So yeah, I'm gonna agree with Joshua that that type of character is so entertaining for the readers to read and just enjoy, right? Because as a, as a writer, you're trying to get at the motivation, figure everything out. And maybe part of you even wants to like bridge the gap and make everyone sympathetic and there's a certain freedom and joy in just being like, this is chaos. We don't know what's gonna happen. And this character could do anything. And that's both frustrating, like, okay, well, what's that character going to do? But also when you get it right and you're like, yes, yes, this is, I had this perfect situation and we have this, this chaotic character come in and blow it up. That was the right thing. And that made the scene. Then you know that you've got it. Okay, Mark? Yeah, I think those characters are great fun, but I do think that if they're to succeed, they may not operate by logic, but they operate by appetite. They're, people have reasons that they do things. They, the reasons might be primal, they might be driven by hungers of various sorts, but they are not reasonless. So I think they work really well when the writer is in touch with the appetites that are driving them. To me, they work less well when they are just the tools of the writer. They need a little randomness, so they throw them in because it's fun. Then to me, it doesn't feel like we're being honest with the reader and it doesn't feel like we've done the hard work yet. But I, I think they can be great. I just think you have to, as a writer, really be in touch with the appetites that are driving them. Okay. So backing up a few steps out of chaotic evil into maybe a lawful or neutral evil into that... Uh, that villain who is the hero of his own story, how much do you have to sympathize with the villain's perspective to write a compelling villain? Joshua? Um, well, if you're gonna write the villain uh, in a compelling way, I think you need to get yourself inside the villain's head, so I think I think you do have to be sympathetic with, with as a writer, with uh, with the villain, uh, him or herself in the book. So, so yeah, there is some sympathy. Uh, you certainly have to have sympathy as the writer. Um, I don't know how much sympathy you really have to create generally for the reader. I mean, does the reader really need to be sympathetic with the villain in the long run? Um, I think they need to understand the villain. Um, I think they need to be able to follow what the villain is doing, but I'm not necessarily certain they have to be sympathetic with the villain. Um, I mean, it is, after all, the villain. <laughs> they need to be sympathetic with the uh, protagonist, but the antagonist, uh, I'm not 100% certain. Um, but as the writer, you definitely have to be sympathetic. You have to be able to give that villain the motivation that they need. And I don't, I don't see any way to do that without being sympathetic with the villain as the writer. Okay, Mark? Yeah, I, I think sympathetic isn't necessary, but compelling and understandable are to me. So we need villains that interest us, that are compelling in some way. And I think we need to have ideally some sense of what is driving them so that that motive is, is forceful and powerful to us. But, you know, I don't know that we have to sympathize because normally we sympathize with the other side. Okay, Sherry? Yeah, I agree with what's been said before is that the key is to understand where the, the villain is coming from and even if we can understand that, we don't necessarily have to be in a position of saying they're in the right. As long as we understand, then we can see the conflict. And Valerie. Yeah, as everyone's saying, um, 
if you think of individually about the great villains, some of them, like Professor Umbridge, nobody sympathizes with. But you can do some great stories if you are doing that. I was watching a lot of national theater in 2000, and I caught Frankenstein with Cumberbatch and Johnny Lee Miller, where even more than the book, we are watching the monster's life story, and man, do we sympathize. And I was also watching Amadeus. I liked the play even better than the movie. And um, it's so compelling watching the bad, again, we're following the bad guy's story through the whole thing and watching how miserable and fed up he is. So you can tell a really great story either way. Okay. In another Here. panel, we, we brought up um, Cruella de Vil, which is coming out as a movie mm -hmm. We all agree that despite the fact that there's an entire movie dedicated to showing her side of the story, no one's going to sympathize with someone who wants to kill puppies. None of us. And of course, there's Wicked, which takes the point of view of the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, it helps that there's great music. Uh, that always helps a good villain. But uh, now here's where it starts to get kind of muddy because if you have a war, you have soldiers who go out to do a thing and they shoot people and they blow things up and and in the exigencies of war they may uh do some pretty horrible things for a good cause and on the other side there are soldiers who go to war and shoot people and blow things up and do some things that might be really horrible in service of their cause at what point do we have characters who are mirrors of each other. And when it comes to sympathizing or understanding that it's really just a question of whose side did the dice roll of fate put you on? Because if you had been brought up on the other side of the line, whatever it is, you'd be rooting for the other guy. So how does that play into it? Because it can get very messy when we start going down some of these side roads. Joshua? I just started with me because this is my favorite. <laughs> this is one of my favorite um, sort of conundrums to uh, think about when I, before I start writing anything. Um, because I really do believe that when uh, a reader picks up a book and starts reading, that they're already biased because the writer has biased them as to who the hero is and who the villain is because the reader starts the book thinking whoever I'm starting with that's the hero right and so there, there's already this automatic bias when you start reading a book that 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 you've already chosen a side so to speak so um, uh, a lot of my thinking ahead of time before I start writing something is, is to actually sit back and say, you know, what, who actually is the hero here? And, you know, why am I choosing to write from this character's perspective? Um, because I fully admit that pretty much all of my books, the book starts off with the, with the hero's perspective. Um, but I have all these ideas for, or I'm playing around with all these ideas for how to write a book where you don't know. Uh, the reader doesn't even know. I mean, they're going to start with an assumption, but I want to, I want to start playing with that assumption right off the bat and start saying, you know, okay, are you really sure this is the hero? What if the hero does something really horrible? Um, that's one of the things I was doing with my Throne of Amon course series actually is you start off and yes, it ends up being the hero, but she does some really, really horrible things uh, in the beginning of the book. And, and I was trying to explore that idea. When, when does that character cross the line and where something they've done ends up being too much and they end up being uh, the villain in the end. And I mean, I had the character in the book, the character was fighting with this as well. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a great uh, question. I don't think it has a nice answer. Um, and I think that all writers really need to ask themselves these, that type of question while they're writing. You know, is your, is your character really the hero or are you just framing this character as the hero for this particular book? 
Okay. Sherry? So um, a long time ago, not a long time ago, but a while ago, there was a Saturday Night Live sketch and it was Batman being confronted by the people of Gotham City. Has, did anyone else see this? And so it was very interesting because I've always thought of Batman as the hero, right? But in this skit, it was being turned around. The people of Gotham City are like, how much money have you spent because of the, de you know, the destruction you've caused our city? Why is it that you're always, you know, you were born to wealth and yet you're picking on our people in the lower socioeconomic class. You know, you're unanswerable to anything because you're a vigilant. And it was, it really like, my eyes were like this big and I'm like, oh my gosh, because this is, it's really answering your question, Gail, which is I had always identified with Batman. He was going out and fighting crime, but wait a minute, how would that appear to the people of Gotham City? Maybe not everyone's happy about the way that this is happening. I did a short story once for a superhero anthology with a hero whose ability was telepathic and she could force anyone to see themselves as they really were without alibis, without excuses. And this was devastating to the people that she was sent against. But the government wouldn't send her out anymore because without the YouTube videos of all the flying cars and the destruction and the explosions, it was too hard to get the budgets through because it looked too easy. So even though she was 100% uh, successful in her missions, she got benched because she wasn't dramatic. So there you have it. Valerie? And um, Sherry's point, when do the, you know, uh, superheroes go too far over the line. That, of course, would be the boys, if anybody has been mm -hmm. watching that one. And um, to answer the, you know, obviously, there are so many good epics that plop around the, you know, both camps and take a look at the effects of war on the generals and little guys and stuff. But where do you cross that line? I'm going to use the word Daenerys. When, you know, if you're slaughtering civilians you have crossed the line and a really good one just recently in i think it's ya although it's very dark is the poppy war where the heroine you know has to be super violent to win the war for our side and we're the good guys and blah 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 and then has she embraced violence so much she won't find her way back and dealing with that over a three book arc is amazing. So if people are, you know, exploring this, totally check that one out. Okay, Mark. I think almost every interesting hero goes too far sometimes. And so I think we are willing to forgive that as readers in order to get the drama and the stories that we want. But, uh, I think if everyone behaves rationally and reasonably, there's very rarely conflict. <laughs> you know, if, and the stories get boring, well, I see your side of it. Let's sit down together and have dinner and talk it through. And then you have a John Updike story and I'm not, you know, which isn't my cup of tea. And so I prefer things that have a, a little more forward thrust in the plot. And so I think in, inevitably we accept that heroes go too far and, and it is fascinating to watch uh, and think about what happens when they do. I think confronting them with that is a good thing. But I also think the other thing to think about that, that I've always been fascinated with is um, what happens when they don't go far enough. You know, if, if you're reading uh, Batman and he's at home having dinner, somebody died he could have saved. And in a way, that's the dilemma all of us. Every time we spend money on ourselves, we could have given it to charities that could have helped people. And Watching heroes with extraordinary abilities have to draw those lines has always fascinated me. Well, and, and the idea of going too far comes back to the quote about if you're a hero, you may live long enough to become the thing you hunt. And that's a fascinating uh, point where the person you've been rooting for does cross that line, goes too far and may not realize it yet. And then can they be brought back from that? Do they want to be brought back from it? Is there a freedom in becoming the villain? Because you don't have to worry about how many people died while you were having a nice steak dinner. You just had a nice steak dinner. 
So what about, um, you know, we always talk, we often have a, a hope that the hero can somehow save the villain. But have you seen stories out there where instead the villain corrupts the hero and they write off Thelma and Louise Stow to uh, wreak havoc? Sherry? That's a great question. Um, I'm drawing a blank. I feel like there should be a, at least a couple like well-known stories like that, but I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, the, hey, aren't you done with this saying stuff? Look, they aren't even grateful. Come on, let's go howl at the moon, which yeah. is a supernatural quote for the folks who might watch that show. Mark? I think comics are full of characters that get a certain amount of power, go too far, and then sometimes they get brought back, sometimes they don't, like Dark Phoenix and X-Men and... Um, Various versions of Captain Marvel at various times go a little too far, accidentally destroy a world. You know, it's, I think that joining though, I, I can't think of one where they intentionally join. I think it's more that they start seeing another side to it. But I do think it's a, it would be a fun thing to play with that, to have people, and people do change teams sometimes. Um, because there's frequently in, in conflicts, there's not just two sides. There are lots of different sides going on. Mm -hmm. Valerie? Yeah, I was searching those out because that's the villain's journey. The traditional one is um, the hero wins, like Medea gets to marry her prince and lives happily ever after, and then she corrupts and the story continues. So it really is a question of where you cut this off because as the hero becomes the ruler, the hero often becomes the corrupted ruler. So I found a lot, but most of, an awful lot of them, they don't go that bad or as stated like with Dark Phoenix or something, they go bad and then they reform. And yes, there's this big arc where they take a look in the mirror. like. Buffy, the season eight comics, once she's in charge of all the Slayers, she starts stealing to fund them because power corrupts, but she only becomes like 5% bad, not evil, evil. And uh, Buff Faith corrupts Buffy for an episode. And I was thinking of Fantastic Beasts with everyone playing tug of war with the powerful young kid who, well, he's been shifting between good and evil and we have yet to see where he's going. So I see a lot where the bad mentor and the forces of good are both tugging at this person going, we want you to be chosen one for our side, which is also Anakin. And often he chooses evil. Sometimes he chooses evil and then he's going to change his mind in a few episodes. Yeah. Um, Sarah Douglas's epics have a lot of characters switching from really good to really evil for really believable reasons but you just sit there and go wow you were such a good guy two books ago and now you have absolutely sworn to the forces of evil because your girlfriend betrayed you wow bad joshua um i couldn't think of anything off the top of my head but i wanted to point out somebody in the chat said dune uh, the protagonist of the first book of Dune becomes the antagonist of the second book in Dune. And uh, so I wanted to point that out. Um, and also, the, the, as Mark said, the, there are a lot of characters where they kind of switch sides like Catwoman, you know, where they'll do something good, but then the next thing you know, they're doing something bad and whatnot, and they kind of flip flop back and forth. Um, but I have to agree with everybody that it seems like the majority of the, any uh, good guy that goes bad that you can think of, somehow in the storyline, they end up switching back or get redeemed or something along the lines. I, I, I'm not pulling up anything where they go bad and they stay bad forever. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and, you know, that was a, a a big trope in Supernatural is everybody got a chance to be possessed by demons or angels. Everybody got a chance to either be hooked on demon blood or have the mark of pain and go out of control. And then they got reeled back and became even more scarred heroes again. So there you have it. Because uh, I've seen a number of, of Buffy references. So uh, yeah, same, same kind of thing. 
Now, if you did have a hero, a, a hero slash villain like that, um, let's be realistic. How interested would readers be in a hero who switches sides and starts fighting for the guys you've spent the first half of the book convincing the reader are the bad guys? Um, under what circumstances might a reader accept that? Valerie? Captain Marvel did exactly that. They spent the whole movie saying these are the bad guys. And then when more information was revealed, she switched. She went from good to better because more information was released. So as we keep saying, if there are two sides in a war, no, in real life, that does probably does not mean one side is ultimate evil. Although once in a while, you know, we need more information here. But absolutely, oh, she is mentioned in the chat as one where we uh, corrupt people and uncorrupt people, absolutely. Uh, there are so many ways we can keep sympathy. And one really big thing to look at is not just how much do we understand where the character is coming from, but how bad is the stuff they're doing because Wicked, especially the musical, what she's doing is not really that bad. And the other bit would be the redeeming bit where, okay, you slaughtered the whole village, but you also let the puppy go. So we're a little sympathetic because, come on, you let the puppy go. Holly Lisley's epic fantasies were really great about, okay, this person is a thousand percent evil, but likes puppies. Save the cat. Mark? I think people will go along if, if we explain it well and if we, as writers, make the context rich enough. I think we frequently simp simplify context to do that, uh, to keep the story's narrative thrust. But um, to pick a real world example right now, if you look at the conflict in, between the Palestinians and the Israelis, the United States is giving money to both sides. And does that make the United States bad, good, what? And I think it, it makes it all of the above because it's a complex political situation. And so I think when stories have that complexity of the real world in them, uh, then, then we're gonna see some, you know, sympathy is possible for all sides involved. Okay, Sherry? So I'm thinking of the novel, um, The Traitor of Baru Kormorov. And um, so well written, you understood why she was making the choices. You understand that she was gonna take it down, but it was tough to read. And I did not read the second or third book in the trilogy because I felt so emotionally wrung out because I didn't know, I, my feelings were just all over the place because of the choices that our main character was making. So even, even though I understood her motivation, even though I agreed, it, that was, it was hard. It was hard. And like I said, I, I did not enter into the second or third book, even though I admired the writing. Joshua? Um, I think uh, it comes down to what Valerie said. I, I think as long as more information is given and, and there's a, like Mark said, a believable, reasonable, reason that they they switched either either you know the good guy becoming the bad guy or taking on the on the villain's point of view or vice versa the villain becoming you know the good guy um it, it i think it all comes down to gaining more information about the situation um because you always start the situation with a with a set of preconceived notions uh, any situation um one of the things I'm playing around with the with the series I'm writing right now is that the the entire first book, you know, the a certain um, set of 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 people are, are the bad guys, right? You go through the whole book, and all of the main characters pretty much think that these guys are the bad guys, and then in the second book they start finding out more and more and more, and they uh, end up quote unquote switching sides. Uh, and with that additional information, they can make, uh, you know, an, a more informed decision about who's good and who's bad, at least according to them. 
Sherry, when you mentioned uh, the book that, that really took an emotional toll on you, uh, for me, that was uh, John Le Carre's Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. You go, spoilers here, it's a 40, 50, 60 year old book. Um, you go the whole way through thinking the protagonist is the good guy. At the very end, you find out she's been manipulated and lied to and she's actually the villain, even though she never thought she was. Um, so that, yeah, that, and <laughs> that's just one of those where you sit there and stare off into the abyss for a while. Realistically, how a lot of the examples you've given where people have switched sides or gotten more information and then seen things from a different light, they've all been fantasy or not set in this world. And of course, we know, like Star Trek and all of those, it is much easier to have people rationally look at circumstances when they aren't real and they're not bringing their cultural and personal and emotional and family baggage to the situation. And I'm, I'm intentionally staying vague and not naming specifics or giving examples because I want to discuss the concept, not get stuck in the weeds. How, how realistic is it that you could write a book set in the real world where sw someone switches sides like that and retains the reader's sympathy? Uh, Mark? Uh, the Red Sparrow books? Have you, you know, there was a movie made of it. It's a woman who starts out as a spy for Russia. She was sort of tricked and, and abused into it, but was an effective spy, ultimately came to see uh, and join the, the American side. And it's written by an ex CIA chief of station. And I found it pretty believable. Uh, definitely, it's a, the movie was fun, but it, the books are much better than the movies, um, than the movie. And I think that in general, in sp spy work, you find people changing sides a lot more because that's the essence of recruiting. You know, you recruit assets by getting them one way or another, sometimes due to belief, sometimes for money, sometimes from blackmail. But in general, the most effective assets for any spy are assets who join your team because they believe. Okay. Sherry? So I, I'm trying to think. So, you know, as human beings, we want to belong to groups and, and that's how we're identifying. We identify in, in, in several different ways, right? We've got these different circles that make up who we are. And to switch sides, to, to join a different group, that's hard. And it can be done, but I think that it's gonna require a carrot or a stick or intense self analysis to understand, okay, this is the information I had, this is the experience I had, which led me to be part of this group. And then to have the courage to change or that the stick is, is hard enough and difficult enough to make you change or the carrot is enough to make you change. But it's not something that I think most humans want to do on their own. I think that we get comfortable in, in where we are and comfortable in belonging and we'll put up a, with a lot <laughs> to keep that sense of belonging before we're willing to push through. Okay, Joshua? Yeah, I, I totally agree with Sherry. Um, humans don't change. <laughs> I mean, in, in the real world, it, it, when a, what it really boils down to is, is humans in general just won't change. Uh, they, they like where they are, they don't wanna move, they, they like their patterns and all that kind of stuff. It really, I mean, think about how many relationships that you, you may have had where you were hoping the other person would change so that everything would work and then it just never happens. Because um, people just in the real world just do not want to change. It, it takes, like Sherry was saying, it takes a really massive carrot or a really massive stick in order to force someone to actually change. Um, and in the real world, it's a little easier in books, right? Because uh, in, in, when you're writing that story, uh, no matter how much you try to make your, your characters as nuanced as possible, they will still never be as nuanced as a real person. Um, because we're, 
to make somebody that nuanced in a book, you'd have to have to write thousands and thousands of pages. Um, unfortunately, when we write, we have to simplify things a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I think in the real world, a real world context for getting somebody to change is, is exponentially impossible. Okay, Valerie? Oh, however, um, you also find the characters who are not that committed to their team, were forced to be on their team because, you know, that country won't let them out, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you can get the double agents who are willing to be a triple agent. You can get the people who have spent all their life wishing they could defect, but have been unable to up until this point. And all these, of course, would not be major personality changes. And no, it's not a real world example, but I found myself thinking of Stargate episode one. Tiuk is a bad guy. He goes around, you know, shooting civilians for his boss, um, even if he lets some of them go, blah, blah, blah. But the minute he meets somebody who says, I can give you a career change, I can see that you don't want to be doing this, let's go. Tiuk does not change personalities, but he absolutely changes teams and never looks back. So again, if the character doesn't really want to be on that team, and also so much fun with good omens where, yeah, he's an angel and he's a demon, but they're both the lowest foot soldiers to the point. I love the book's description about, you know, like the little French uh, sentry and the little German sentry who are born um, sympathy with each other and sharing smokes back and forth that they are with the higher ups who are making them do all this crud. So here's a question. If the hero saves the villain and brings the villain over to the good guy's side, but the villain continues to use his highly effective tactics, but on the side of good, is he still a villain? Has he become a, will we forgive a hero doing all those heinous things as long as he's on our side? Or is he still a villain? Joshua? Um, he's still a villain. <laughs> um, it, because basically what, what, what's happened in my opinion in that situation is that the heroes have, have decided that, that the ends justify the means and, and they've decided to accept the villain on their side uh, and kind of, you know, ignore the fact that he's really a villain and uh, because they want to accomplish something and they haven't been able to figure out how to do it themselves. So they're willing to accept uh, this alternative method and, uh, and they've rationalize to themselves that it's acceptable. Um, that's another thing I like playing around with in books is, is you know, what, when, when does something become unacceptable? When do you cross that line? But, it, but in, in reality, it's just the, the good guys have convinced themselves that this is acceptable. Um, and so the good guys have become an alternate villain having recruited the villain. Essentially, yeah. And, and what I like to push is, you know, at what point are they going to say no, that's no longer acceptable. Um, I like playing around with that in the book. Okay, Sherry. So then this makes me think of um, Sarah J. Moss's A Court of Thorns and Roses. And one of her most popular characters is the spy master, right? And I think the next book is going to be his, his love story. But up until this point, He's the one who's been handling the torture. He's the one who gets the answers where the book actually fades to black and leaving us to imagine the horrible things he's doing to extract this information. So I'm very interested to see what she's gonna do in this upcoming book where he becomes our main character. I, I don't know. Mark? Yeah, I'm, I actually want to disagree with Joshua on two points. Um, first, I think people do change. I think that the, the arc of progress is upward, that most of us are trying to be better all the time. I think in the course of my life, I've seen societal assumptions um, improve, and, and I hope that I have learned from them and tried to improve, and I think a lot of people do. 
So I, I actually am very hopeful about the idea that people change and, and I think even change in, in fundamental ways. It's just work and I don't think, I would agree most people don't, but I do think that it is possible for us all. And I like to believe right now in this country where we're at least big chunks of this country are changing and need to, I, myself included. Um, and then the other thing is I, I do think it is easy to accept somebody changing sides and their skill sets because both sides are already using the same skill sets. You know, if you look in a war, they're using propaganda, they're using weaponry, they're using uh, hand-to-hand combat, they're using bombs, they're all using the same thing. So when somebody switches sides, it's like a skill set thing. They're going to bring their skill set with them. And I think we can let them do it. I think we will, however, where I'd agree with Josh is we'll still, as readers, distrust them. And we will need significant, um, significant, uh, reasons to believe them snape you know snape takes it takes a lot for us to buy it uh and it takes the ultimate sacrifice for us to buy it but i think that the same skills play on both sides in any conflict and we we can change and care more um when it's done well i just think it's very hard to do well okay valerie snape is an interesting one because if we define the heroes and villains as, you know, let's say they all want to improve the world and they all think their team is right, one big difference can be what they're willing to sacrifice to make it happen. Because so many of the heroes would say, well, I wouldn't kill civilians, or no, I wouldn't do that, or I wouldn't pursue myself as James. And the villain is sitting there going, yeah, break a few eggs, sure, help the population, whatever. So for Snape, yeah, he does 100% switch sides because the cost is the one thing he's not willing to give up. So that can work. And going back to what happens when we employ the villains and have them, you know, be our police or something like that. Um, hiring Nazi rocket scientists was brought up in the chat. And yeah, one thing I think of is the Dementors in Harry Potter. Okay, they're like inherently evil and kill souls, but we'll use them as prison guards and this won't blow up in our faces. And then it blows up in our faces and they always worked for Voldemort. And I'm putting in the chat so many movies, often humorous, where the villain decides to use his power for good or to help little girls or something. And the results are usually silly, messed up and not very moral, but despicable me where he's, you know, firing his tank at the selfish coffee guy and stuff is quite funny. All right, lightning round because we have less than 30 seconds apiece. But in that less than 30 seconds, tell us please where people can find you online. Sherry? Uh, so my website is www.tasteofsherry.com. I'm on Twitter at Sherry Woosley. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook, Sherry Cook Woosley. Okay, Mark. I put it in the chat, uh, markfanname.com, and my books are in Amazon, Barnes & Noble bookstores. Okay, Valerie. Yeah, uh, Valerie Estelle Frankel on Amazon is good. Joshua. Uh, joshuapalmatier.com, zombiesneedbrains.com. I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for my name and uh, my books and the Zombies Need Brains book you can pretty much find at most of the bookstore sites. Okay. I'm at gailzmartin.com, morganbrice.com. Uh, you can find me on Facebook under those names and on Continual, uh, the Facebook group, Martin Shadow Alliance in the world of Morgan Bryce. Well, folks, we made it through. Uh, thank you so much for being wonderful panelists. Thank you to everybody who watched and listened. And thank you to the Balticon programming gods and our tech gurus for making this possible. Have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend, and we hope to see you online.